In this second video on Resolver Ballot, we're going to take a look at an existing ballot file for the purpose of running an assessment or workshop. Specifically, we're going to take a look at the final setup required for voting just before your session starts, whether this be with keypads or with web voting. Previously, we looked at how to set up a ballot file and how to add or edit items and criteria for our assessment. Once that has been completed, we're ready at any point to get things going. If you're working off of an existing file that has votes, then you'll probably want to save this information so that you don't overwrite that existing data. For this, click on the File tab and then Save As to save a new version. Next, you can navigate to the Vote and Report tab. The first option in the Vote and Report area is Views. Back in the setup video, we showed you how you can create views, which can be used for larger ballot files to, in essence, break them up into smaller chunks, giving you the ability to present specific items to certain groups, rather than everyone seeing everything which may not be relevant to them. Just remember to keep this option in the back of your mind, should it be something that would be useful for you. From the Voting tab, the first thing we're going to take a look at are the voting options. This can be done later in the actual voting screens as well, but it's worth taking a look at this before we start our session. For the count vote section, we can have everyone counted with either the live count option or automatically when they first vote. Also here, we can set notifications should there be a change in the number of voters as we progress through a session. In the finish voting when section, you can set when you want the results to display. We will see coming up that no matter what the option selected here is, you can still manually stop the voting at any time from the voting screen. Also here are options for automatic advancing to the next vote and voting sound configurations. Next, we need to complete the communication setup. This can be done from either the voting and then communication setup at the top of the window or from the setup link in the guide on the right hand side of the screen. In the window that opens, we'll start with the keypad voting. This has been the traditional voting method for Resolver Ballot prior to version 7.0 where web voting was actually introduced. Keypad voting requires that you connect the keypad's base station or receiver to your computer. If this is the first time the base station is being connected, you will be required to install the proper drivers, which are included with the ballot installation package. Once that's done, from the drop-down list, select the receiver type and then click Scan for Receivers. When the receiver responds, the port will be marked as Yes selected. A new dialog box will then open where you can optimize the response times for the keypads and base. Ideally, the lower the number here, the better but this still must be greater than the highest ID number for any of the keypads which are going to be used. Although not required, at this point you can test the keypads to ensure they are able to communicate with the base station. This is done from the Test Keypads tab at the top of the window. A grid will show all of the keypad numbers, click Start Voting, and then press any button on each of the keypads that are going to be used. The numbers pressed on the keypads will appear in the relevant square in the grid. Once done, click the Stop Voting. As mentioned earlier, another option for voting is web voting. This allows participants to vote remotely using PC, Mac, tablet, or smartphone. Click the web voting tab at the top of the window, and you'll see your account information in the top left. The session name allows you to title this session and will be seen by participants when they log in. The session password is optional, but if added, participants will be prompted to enter what that password is after you click the Start New Session. It should be noted that sessions are already protected even without this password because participants can only join a session with a six-digit access code, which is your account number, or if they've been invited by a facilitator. The session description is also optional, and this can be used to provide additional information regarding the session for your participants while they're waiting for the first vote. When it comes to the web conference tool section, if you're going to be using a web conferencing tool as a part of your session, here you can select the type of tool that's being used, then copy and paste the meeting link into the field below. An email invitation will be sent to the facilitator with the session details and potentially this meeting link if it's being used, which you can then forward on to your participants. Next, the smallest keypad ID will be used if you're using both keypad and web voting at the same time. Here you must indicate a number that is greater than the largest numbered keypad that will be in use. Finally, once all has been configured, you can click the Start New Session button to begin. Typically, you would do this at least 5 to 10 minutes before a session is scheduled to begin, but it can be started as early as you see fit. A couple of prompts will appear at this point, one indicating that starting a new session will clear any existing web voters, and then another indicating that an invitation email has been sent. Once again, this can be forwarded to any participants so that they can connect and attend the session. If you don't have the email addresses for all attendees, they can be directed to the Resolver website to log into Ballot as well. Accessing the session from here will require them to enter in the access code, which again, is your account number.
The last dialog box will indicate that you must recount voters in order to begin voting. From the link on the side of the screen, we can jump to the count voters. In this window, on the left side is the local voters, which would be the keypads if being used, while on the right side we have the web voters if that is being used. Click the start button at the top of the window to count the voters. If you are using the stakeholders option and want the participants to identify which group they belong to, navigate to the voting option in the toolbar at the top, then identify stakeholders. This will take you to a vote screen where you can then click on the vote now button in the top of the window to have participants identify their group. As a reminder from our previous video, this function only works when you have at least three people per stakeholder group. Otherwise, you undermine the purpose of the anonymous voting. Now, we're ready to start the session. This can be done in one of two ways. From the grid, you can double click on one of the blank cells to jump to a specific item, or you can click on the vote link on the right side of the window. Then select the criteria that you'd like to start with. In the voting screen, participants can see the item text in the top left. On the top right is the criteria text. Below that is the rating scale and where your votes will appear. Across the top are options to modify the appearance of the data captured by the vote. Remembering back to our setup video, any of the sample files that were discussed in that setup video and then using these options to manipulate the display could be a good way for you to determine what might be best whenever you need to run a session. A navigation bar in the top right allows the facilitator to advance through the different items and criteria that's going to be looked at in the session. The up and down arrows can be used to navigate between items, or risks in this example. These will be ordered by how they were ordered in the table shown a little earlier. The left and right arrows can be used to navigate between the criteria, or the impact and likelihood in this example. Clicking the right arrow after the last piece of criteria for an item has been voted on will automatically advance you to the next item. Clicking on the item or criteria buttons beside the up, down, and the left, right arrows will display the list of items or criteria, which you could then use as an alternate way to navigate between these as well. For the actual vote, click the Vote Now button for the participants to see the item and criteria. Keypad users will then press the appropriate button on their keypads, whereas web voters will see their options and can either click on the value or press the associated number on their device or keyboard to identify which one they select. Once the voting has stopped, the web voters will then be able to see the results from the vote. Should a voter need to change their vote for whatever reason, this can be done as long as the voting is still open.